Hello all, I've got some exciting news. I've released version 15 of my astrophotography macros, and because it's such a big update, I wanted to do a video covering some of the new and updated features. This isn't an in-depth instructional video, but I will cover best practices for using some of the new macros, and I'll revisit some of the older macros as well. First, let's cover installation of the macros. You can go to Window, Library, and install the macros using the Panel Options menu. But to be honest, I would recommend just drag-dropping the AF Macros files onto Affinity Photo's interface. This not only installs them immediately, but also brings up the library panel for you, so you're ready to start using them straight away. Now, we'll start by looking at the new mono tone stretching options. I've just stacked this narrowband data using Affinity Photo's Astrophotography Stacking Persona, and I've used file groups to easily stack the three datasets. First, I'll need to double click into each data layer and rename it. So, stacked image 1, H alpha, becomes HA. Stacked image 2, OIII, becomes OIII. And stacked image 3, SII, becomes SII. Now, I'll want to hide the default curves and levels adjustments. Affinity Photo creates these to perform some initial tone stretching so you can actually see detail in your stacked data but we don't need them when using the tone stretching macros, so I can either hide or delete them. I now want to look in the astrophotography 32-bit category. This is really important to note. For the majority of users, you will want to be using the 32-bit category rather than 16-bit. You can tell which bit depth your document is in by looking up here when you have the default view tool selected. If you are stacking in Affinity Photo, or you are bringing in a stacked image in a floating point or rational format, this will likely read RGBA slash 32. If you are bringing in pre-stretched images from other software, these may have been saved in 16-bit integer format, in which case this will read RGBA slash 16. For this workflow, you would want to use the 16-bit macro category. Now I've explained that, I'm going to run Monolog Stretch SHO in the 32-bit category. This will tone stretch each data layer individually. Once it's finished, I can Option click on Mac, Alt click on Windows to solo the data layers, and you can see a huge amount of detail in each one. I can now color map this data. In the Data Setups category, I could choose SHO, HSO, OSH, OHS or HOS mappings, and these would all make use of the complete data set. I can quickly experiment by running one macro, then using undo and trying a different one. I'll go with HSO. Even without these two default adjustment layers, the composited result is quite bright. I do have some blown out star detail here, so I can now go back to my main 32-bit category, scroll down, and apply the Highlight Recovery macro. If the Highlight Recovery ends up looking too flat, I can always click on the layer thumbnail and experiment with the Highlights Range slider. If the image is still too bright and lacking in contrast, there's also a macro I can use called Darken Mono Stretched Result. This looks really crisp. If it's slightly too dark now, however, I can simply adjust the opacity of this layer using the number keys on the keyboard. For example, I could type 7, 5 for 75% opacity. While I'm here, I'll also run the Enhance Nebula Structure macro. This is new as well and applies structural enhancement in a refined manner that avoids bright areas such as star detail. I can actually expand the layer and click on the Star Exclusion Mask thumbnail. To alter this masking behavior, decreasing the maximum slider will make the structural enhancement more aggressive, and highlight threshold will fine tune the highlight masking. Now I want to focus on another big feature I've added the ability to extract one shot color data to mono channels. This has revitalized my interest in revisiting some of my old data that I've acquired with my traditional camera and lens setups. I've found that even with broadband data shot on an unmodified camera, I can pull much more detail out of the stacked result compared to tone stretching the RGB color layer. So with this example, I'll delete the default levels and curves adjustments. 
Then I'll select the Stacked Image 1 layer, and within the Data Setups category, I'll run Extract OSC Layer to Mono RGB. This now gives me three monochrome channels, and I can treat my one-shot color data as if I were working with mono data. So I could now go into the 32-bit category and run Mono Stretch RGB. This stretches the data whilst protecting highlights. I'll go back to the Data Setup category and run RGB Composition Setup. Now that I have the color mapped result, the nebula core is too bright. This information isn't actually clipped, it just can't be displayed on a standard dynamic range display. I'll use the Highlight Recovery macro to bring that highlight detail back in range. And now I need to get rid of this gradient. I'll use Merge Visible to create a merged layer of the layer work so far. Then go to Filters, Astrophotography, Remove Background, and I'll add multiple sampler nodes and experiment with the output black level until I've equalized the background. I can run Enhance Nebula Structure and even repeat it if I want a more pronounced structural enhancement. Zooming into the image, we can see there is a green color cast in the core. This can be neutralized by using one of the SCNR options. In this instance, SCNR Green Neutral slash Max Neutral will do the job. Next, I might run Deepen Color Detail. This performs a subtle yet useful boost to color intensity. If I wanted to take this further, I could stack Enhanced DSO Luminosity on top as well. Scrolling down the list, I could also run Boost Red slash Yellow Detail. These macros are usually too strong at 100% opacity, so the idea is that you reduce the opacity until you find a result that looks good for your own data. I'll try 30%. There's also warm red tones and cool blue tones. Again, these are too strong by default. So I'll drop warm red tones down to 20% and cool blue tones down to 50%. Selecting these layers and hiding them all will allow me to evaluate the initial tone stretched image and then the retouched image. I might decide some of these enhancements are a bit too strong so I can easily go through and reduce the opacity of these layers until I'm happy. I'll also show you the previous tone stretching methods. They've received an upgrade with much better highlight protection. Here I've deleted the default levels and curves adjustments, and for my narrowband data here, I'll run the SHO Composition Setup macro. Now I'll run the normalized tone stretch macro. I can easily compare tone stretching methods. I'll hide this layer, then run logarithmic tone stretch. This allows me to compare the two by simply hiding the top layer. With this composition, the normalized tone stretch produces more of a blue color bias in the background tones and has a somewhat softer contrast. Whereas logarithmic tone stretch has a more pronounced contrast and more of a neutral background tone. I'll show you another example quickly. Here's a close up data set of the Orion Nebula. I've just stacked this, so I'll rename my three data layers to R, G, and B. Then I'll delete the levels and curves adjustments. I'll run the RGB composition setup macro, then run normalized tone stretch. You'll see that the highlight preservation here is really good. There's available detail right up to the brightest parts of the core. If I wanted to take this further though, I could try highlight recovery before tone stretching. I'll hide this normalized tone stretch layer and rename it to before. Then underneath it, I'll run the highlight recovery macro. I can click on the thumbnail to bring the settings dialog up and I'll increase the highlights range to 100%. Now I'll run the normalized tone stretch macro again. Looking at the nebula core, here's the before and after. It flattens out the brightest parts, which could be useful if you're dealing with data that has a very high dynamic range. There's also the color preserving tone stretch. This works best on broadband data or data sets where you're also using a luminance layer with a luminosity blend mode. With the LRGB data here, 
I'll run the lRGB composition setup macro. Then I'll perform a normalized tone stretch. The colors are somewhat muted. I'll hide this layer, then I'll run the color preserving tone stretch. Comparing these two methods reveals more color vibrance in the color preserving tone stretch, which means we need to do less work in order to pull the color detail away from the background tones. If I were to continue editing this image, I might try something like reduce background luminosity, then perhaps enhance nebula structure. The background tones might be slightly too dark at this point. To boost them, I could use a live background mask. I can instantly see the detail that is being masked. Anything that renders as alpha is excluded from the mask. I'll add a curves adjustment, then drag the live background mask layer onto its thumbnail and release the mouse button. This means my live background mask is now acting as a mask for this curves adjustment. I can push the tones up on the curves graph here. And if I then expand the curves adjustment and hide the live background mask layer, the curves adjustment will affect highlight detail as well. Showing the mask again lets me prevent that highlight detail from becoming too bright. While I'm here, let me try Enhance Red Signal, which helps to bring out these fainter regions of red color. I can finish off with some sharpening. There are several sharpening methods provided with these macros, but my favorite is probably Bandpass Sharpening. This is based on the absolute point of focus sharpening method and has been heavily requested by users, so I've implemented it in a non destructive form. I've found that the micro variant typically works quite well for most imagery. Wide provides the strongest contrast enhancement, but you can, of course, easily change the opacity of the bandpass sharpening group to control its strength. You might even want to try stacking different variants and altering the opacity values. As always, part of the fun comes from experimentation. I've shown but a few examples here of how the macros can be used, and I look forward to seeing how other people will use them. I hope you found this video helpful, and thank you for watching.